Good morning, everybody. Today is hump day, Wednesday, May 25th. Welcome to What the Hell is Water. This is episode 105. Uh, We're running a smidge behind schedule today, and we have a guest. So I am going to blaze through our recap, and then we'll get right over to that. So yesterday on episode 104, we had a repeat guest, Kalina Cahill, and we talked about travel, about what the purpose of it is and what you get out of it, um, all of the benefits it can bring you, and... Uh, Kaylina relayed to us uh, some of her personal experiences with travel and including her recent trip she took to Peru where she was there for uh, I believe three plus weeks and uh, she, she told us what it was like and all the things that or a lot of the things she learned and she shared with us some of her pictures as well um, but really emphasized how big of a how important travel is to her Um, And likewise, for me, uh, travel is a huge thing. So check that one out. Our our, uh, challenge for yesterday was to uh, plan what your travel is going to be. Plan what your next travel is going to be. And if, especially if you're someone who has not traveled far away from where you're at, consider traveling far away from where you're at. You know, bonus points if it's international, but even if it's just within the same state, or you know country uh, there is a lot you can learn and gain from just changing your environment interacting with new people seeing new things there's so many benefits to it so check out our episode yesterday to learn more about that but i'll drop into our intro now helpful for life and welcome back to What the Hell is Water. I'm Reed Garcia, founder and CEO of Helpful for Life. Um, today, we are talking about a really interesting topic. Oh, but before I mention that, I just want to say a happy anniversary to myself and Danielle. Uh, today, we have been married for nine years um, and together for 14. So, uh, man, man, Danielle's getting old. It's a good thing I still stay young. Uh, but speaking of young, one of what we're talking about today is how we develop our worldviews. How do we learn things and how do we help them shape how we view the world? Um, obviously a very important topic to us here at Helpful for Life and on the show What the Hell is Water? Um, but the two terms we're going to be discussing today around this are assimilation and accommodation. And we have our lovely repeat expert, the fan favored Alexandra uh, Mannerings. I almost called her Alexandra Marakinos because that's the company she she has. Um, but without further ado, let us bring her on. Hello. Uh, good morning. Hello. You got a friend there. I do. This is Eva, which probably is appropriate given our topic today. Yes. I, she looks like she's observing and learning right now. Exactly. <laughs> All the we'll time. See. Just little sponges, huh? That's what they are. <laughs> she's going to say hi. Hi. Nice to see you. (laughs) Thanks. I'm excited for today's topic. Yes. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting one. And like a lot of things, um, you know, this is something I've realized more and more over the last year or so. You know, as you look at kids and how they behave and how they learn and how they do things, Mm -hmm. it's easy for us as adults to think we're like different or Mm -hmm. above them um, in some way. But I've I've learned more and more we're not. And it's like the sooner we accept that, uh, Mm -hmm. hey, we're just human. We've just been around a little longer, but we still have all the same brain and functions. And sure, certain things develop a little bit better. Um, but stop kidding yourself. At the end of the day, we're all still the same human. So accept that we're basically like giant kids. <laughs> yeah. We we tell more complicated stories about how we function. And and as we'll talk about, some things get harder for us than they are for kids, actually. Um, 
And then there's definitely some things that are easier for us because we've been around a little bit longer than it is for kids. But yeah, the, the concepts that I wanted to talk about today, like you said, of assimilation and accommodation. And this is an idea that came around a long time ago around how we learn. And there's certainly been some modifications to it. There's been um, you know, some questioning of where it came from, as with many psychological ideas that have developed over, over the, the decades and centuries. But this idea is that we don't just learn with a blank slate, right? It's not that we our minds are just these chalkboards and you can write anything you want on them. Instead, our minds are programmed to build schemas. And we've talked about this a little bit before with why we have biases, because these schemas allow us to work through the world in just this blazingly fast way. Because rather than having to consider each individual thing that we experience as something brand new, instead we can just fit it into an existing pattern, an existing way of understanding things. And so it's these shortcuts that allow us to interact with the world very quickly, very intelligently, uh, though there are a few problems with it. And, and this is what we'll talk about. So these schemas, you can think about it right with Eva, and I saw this happen with her. This is the classic schema that they use as an example for assimilation versus accommodation. So we have a dog and a cat at home. And so Eva, growing up, right, she sees the dog and the cat, and she creates the schema where dogs are big and fuzzy and cats are little and fuzzy and they both have four legs. So we went on a walk and we passed someone who had a little Westie and she looks at it and she goes, Mau Mau. And we're like, oh no, that's not a Mau Mau, that's a Woof Woof. <laughs> Mau Mau. Like very clearly that is a Mau Mau because it's a new thing I've never seen before, but it's small, has four legs. Duh, it's mom. Funny, <laughs> right? Like it fits the schema of cat. And so this is how assimilation works, right? You build this idea. And before she had seen the dog or cat, right? She didn't have any anything there. There was no schema for that. Then she sees a dog for the first time. She sees a cat for the first time. She builds this schema, this pattern, and says, okay, here's how I categorize dogs. Here's how I do categorize cats. And then she comes across something new, this Westie. She had never seen a Westie before. So it's this little, small, white, fluffy dog with ears that stick straight up, right? And she looks at that and she's like, I'm going to assimilate this new animal. And clearly it fits into one of my, my categories in my schema. And so she has this point now. So she's assimilated this new animal. She says it's clearly a cat, right? Here we are, a cat. Fuzzy, pointy ears, small. So she puts Westie into the cat category. Now, she could stop there with assimilation, right? It's fit into her existing schema. She's good to go. But I'm telling her, no, 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 that's not a, that's not a meow meow, that, that's a woof woof. It's a dog, not a cat. And so she could take another step, which is the accommodation. So she could take her existing schema and she could say, hmm, I have this new thing I've tried to assimilate into my existing schemas, but it's not fitting. My definition of cats as something that's small, fuzzy with pointy ears and four legs isn't working because I have this new thing coming in that fits that, but I'm being told it's not a cat. And I have to figure out how to realign my schemas so that this Westie, which is fitting my current definition of cat, could move over into the dog category. And we can imagine in more complicated things, like the first time that she sees, say, like a raccoon. Okay, well, now she has no category for that. Where does raccoon go? And so now she's going to have to create, if she wants to assimilate, a raccoon or a Westie or these new animals that she's finding, she has to create new schemas or new categories within a broader schema of say animals and figure out how she can redefine how she sees the world to, to accommodate these new things that she's coming across. And the animal examples sort of flip it and fun, but they actually really do go through this. And we go continue to go through this Hey, actually, hold on a second. I think we lost your audio. <laughs> I don't know if a cord got stepped on or something, but um, there you go. Here you again. Okay. I don't know. No, Nothing got changed. No worries. <laughs> um, Technology. But the idea is adults are a lot better at assimilation because we have more complex schemas. So it's much easier for us to find existing places where new ideas can fit in, right? If you learn a new programming language, 
you can fit it into your previous understanding of a programming language. Or if you learn a new recipe, you know how to cook generally. So it's easy to slot a new recipe into your existing schema for cooking. And this is what you talk about on your show, right? Like this is how you try to develop these, these skills for people. But adults are much worse at accommodation because our schemas get a lot more solid. So it's yes. easy for her to just add a new category of like, okay, I have to add raccoon as a right. new category. Fine. I'll just create that new category. I can accommodate that new thing very easily. Adults are not very good at accommodation or you have to work very hard at developing those accommodation skills. Yeah. And I think uh, part of that comes from just the fact that, again, like we'll, as we get older, we think we know more. We think we have a better understanding. We think we know how things are and how the world works and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I personally can't think of uh, assimilation and accommodation without thinking of um, racism is the first thing that pops to mind, uh, but really any kind of stereotype, right? And I, I think it's a great thing to point out, like like you were saying, so we all develop these shortcuts in our brain. And, and by the way, this isn't intentional. This is just how our brains work, right? Because it goes way back to when we were cavemen and fighting off, you know, the animals and just trying to stay alive, right? Well, but I would argue it is very intentional because it works very well 95% of the time, right? It's the reason that we can move through the world so easily, right? Like I, I laugh about when our cat gets outside because he's scared and not very smart. He like looks around and he's like, oh my God, I don't know what to think about all of these things. And he just runs back inside because he can't, <laughs> he has no way of processing all of this huge amount of new information, which is the outside world. But we can travel to an entirely new country and make our way around fairly easily because our brain has these schemas that it can fit new things in and allow us to navigate very quickly. So I think that as we talked about with bias, it's important to recognize that this is actually a very helpful way of going through the world. If we were blank slates, if we just had to like understand everything brand new, I think it would take us all the hundred years of our life to even learn how to function. Right. But it, the downside yeah. is that we also have a very bad habit of stuffing things into categories that don't fit, right? Like the stereotype, what you were saying is we have this stereotype and if it's a negative stereotype of somebody, what say we see somebody and, and attribution theory, which we've touched on before, talks about this. If you have this negative stereotype, when you see someone who belongs in that category, you're going to attribute everything they do to your negative stereotype. And you'll just stuff everything they do into that category rather than accommodating and creating a new category and a new understanding of that person or that group or how that group might be many groups, in fact. Yeah. And if you, you tie that in with, you know, the kind of the us versus them mentality and the tribalism, you know, and the uh, protection aspect, if you will, it's very easy for us to uh, maximize the negative things of those negative groups um, and minimize the positive things. We just kind of brush yes. those off. It's like, oh, that's not that's not how they normally are or what they normally exactly. do. That's that's the exception, yes. right? Um, and that's yes. where that actually ties in great with travel, um, you know, because that's one of the things, you know, I have family and friends in the deep south. Both my parents are from Mississippi, mm -hmm. and I don't want this all to be about racism, but I think it's an easy, easy way for people to relate to this mm -hmm. concept. Um, and you see people around you acting certain ways, and maybe they happen to look a certain way. And so therefore, you think you extract and say, okay, well, because these people are doing that, that's what all people who look like that are mm -hmm. like, right? right. Um, but as you start to travel, and you start to go to these other areas, and you see people who look like this stereotype, acting and doing things in different ways, then that's when you do the accommodation. Is that right? When you have the option to. You, the option you may to. just assimilate <laughs> and take this new information and stuff it into your existing category. Um, and this gets into a concept called cognitive dissonance. So as humans, we do not like being aware of things that don't fit together in our own brains. We do not like the feeling of having two disagreeing beliefs in our head. And what's funny is we'll settle this in two, one of two ways. The first is, like you said, accommodation. Well, we'll go this doesn't fit with my understanding of this group of people. So I'm going to update my understanding of these people so this new information is in alignment with my understanding of the world, which is how we would like to go through the world. It's right. better, it, we, we, 
we get more accurate and if that's how we do it, if we refine how we think about things based on incoming information. Um, but the other thing that we can do is we can per write a story or an explanation of that new thing that makes that new thing fit our old way of thinking. Right. So to your say point, that, say that sentence week, one more time. Say that sentence one more time. We can write stories or explanations about new information we receive that allows them to fit into our old ways of thinking. Yes. OK. Right. Are you saying that's and a good so, thing or a bad thing? It depends on the new information that comes in, right? Again, if we just discarded our current, our ways of thinking every time something slightly new came in, we would get rid of actually a lot of really helpful ways of looking at the world, right? Because like, imagine if you think you're a pretty decent student and you have one bad test. If you took that one bad test and you're like, well, clearly now I'm a terrible student. I'm going to chuck everything else about all my past experience of how I am as a student because I have this new piece of information that is could be that I'm a bad student, right? Or you could assimilate that by explaining, you know what? I had a really bad night last night. You know, I was up until 2 a.m. because I had this stomach flu and I just I wasn't on my A game. So I think that test is an anomaly and I'm going to kind of fit it into my existing schema, my existing understanding that I'm a good student by explaining that it was it was just an off day for me and next time I'm gonna do better. So that would be assimilating that new piece of information without ditching your old way of thinking. So that's an example where that's probably the right way to handle that piece of information. You probably aren't a bad student, um, but we can also have it be very negative, right? Where we have this perception about a group or you know about whatever it is, we get new information and we explain it by like, oh, they just, this person is just being nice to me because they want something from me. Right. Right. Rather than saying, no, maybe they're not a horrible person. Maybe my perception of them as a horrible person is what's wrong. And so those are the two ways you could approach that. You could say, I have put this person into a category where they're a bad person. They're doing these really wonderful things. And I could either accommodate and adjust and say, you know what? Maybe they're not a bad person. Maybe right. I need to redefine that schema or I can assimilate and I could say mm -mm, they're still a terrible person. They're just doing this because, you know, they want me to give them money or whatever, right? Put whatever your your rationale is going to be and we'll write that explanation and then we'll happily stuff that piece of information into our existing schema. Okay, so lots lots of ideas. So I'm just going to kind of throw some of them out there and we're definitely not going to address them all. But it, this made some things pop in my head. So I, I'll figure yeah. I share for people if they want to check it out. Um, so first off, one of the things that popped into my head um, is with that last thing you're talking about. Um, I believe we talked about this in an episode with Eric Wooten, our relationships expert, about having someone in your life who is always doing something a certain way, but yet you fail to change your expectations of them. And then you mm -hmm. just uh, punish yourself, basically, because yeah. you're like, oh, this person is doing this thing because they dislike me or whatever. It's like, no, that's just how that person's going to be. Or even if they do dislike you, stop expecting them to change. Uh, right. Because, yeah, update your schema. Exactly. <laughs> and you'll yes. be much, much better off. Um, so we'll, yeah. we'll share a link to that episode in the chat. And then this also makes me think of the book Crucial Conversations, um, mm -hmm. which um, I've mentioned on the show a handful of times. But it's a great book that really helped me realize just how much we in our head take little bits of information that we have, which, oh, by the way, is limited, right? All information we get is limited. Uh, and then we write stories for people in our head based on what we see. A classic example of this is someone cuts you off in the car, in, on, in your car. And so, so often people take that personally as if that person even knows who the heck you are or has anything to do with you. It's like, no, nah, they're just maybe a bad driver or maybe they just didn't see it or maybe they're distracted or maybe they're having a horrible day or whatever, right? Um, yeah. And then another thing I wanted to mention because it just popped in my head so vividly, especially as we talked about the racism aspect. There's a movie, uh, Crash, um, mm -hmm. there's from, uh, I don't know, the 90s or something like that, uh, maybe early 2000s. But uh, Ludacris, who's a rapper actually as well, but he, he's just, uh, there's a scene, I think it's near the beginning of the movie, where he's walking down the street and he's talking about th there's these what this white couple walking towards him or whatever, and then they cross the street. And he's like, see, this is just so messed up. These people crossing the street just because some black guy's walking at them, and then they go on for a second, and then they go and like steal a car or something like that. And then and so it's like, it's kind of like funny it, you know it's just like pointing it out uh and then the last thing was um you know talking about how us humans making all these shortcuts in our brain you know but one it is a good thing it helps us get through the world um but two it 
can be a bad thing. Just like with bias, the main thing to to know is that that it is a thing that exists and we can accommodate for these things and we know that this information is happening uh, and these biases and these things our brains are doing these shortcuts so we can know that it can be both good and bad and and act off of it um and one one thing that made me think of was a a, a video of a youtuber mark rober shared about autism which i think we may have mentioned on a previous show mm -hmm. as well um and that one is wh where it, it talks about how with autism, part of your problem is you have trouble filtering all of the information. And so it makes the world very overwhelming because you can't focus on the conversation at your table because mm -hmm. you're hearing everyone at the entire restaurant, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so again, feel free to respond to some of that yeah. or none of that. But those were, as you were going on, I didn't want to interrupt, but yeah. those things all popped into my head. No, absolutely. And I mean, and, and again, like that's why these schemas are helpful because probably at the top of that, the schema of like what's important and what's not. And some of that distinguishing happens unconsciously, right? Like your brain is getting thousands, hundreds of thousands of incoming information. And then as it comes in, your brain's going, this is important, this isn't. And so unconsciously, your brain can kind of update, what do I perceive as important? And what do I perceive as not important? Um, and you can manage what comes in and what, what doesn't come in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that this whole idea of understanding that this is how we learn Right? This is one of the ways, right? This is a, a fundamental structure of, of our learning is that this will help you make sure that you learn the things intentionally that you want to learn in the ways that you want to learn them. I think the more that you try to just be like, oh, no, that's not how I function or, oh, no, 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 you know, I... I can be completely open-minded and I just take new new information that comes. I treat it totally openly. You know, I have no preconceived notions about this stuff. Like we all do. It was, you know, when we talked about last week of like, you know, checking to see if your in for incoming information is biased. Like it is. Just accept, just assume it is because it right. is. <laughs> and this thing is like, uh, know that you're going to approach something with an existing schema. If you're not six months old, you have schemas in place. So be aware of them and use them to your advantage. Think about how you can adjust that. Yeah, uh, it, it's a it's a, a, a very interesting thing, right? And and you know, another thing that popped into my head was, hey, recognizing that, especially with people. Um, one big step is to recognize that people are multifaceted and there's a lot more to them than what you're hyper simplifying them to do. And another great point, which is something that, you know, of course I inherently knew, but it wasn't until somebody told me or I heard it on a podcast or something. Um, and this kind of came to my mind when it came to divorce. Like when someone's going to get a divorce, you're like, oh, I would never have expected them to get a divorce. They're always so happy and so great. And it's like, well, what is my view? Of, what is my data that I'm getting from them? Well, I only see them when we're hanging out and having a party and having a good time or, or there were they came over to have a good time. Like you, I'm not seeing 99.9% .9 of their lives. Uh, but it's so easy for us to take that little bit of information we have from that one setting. Oh, no, by the way, forgetting that the context of that setting generally probably is a happy and great one. Well, you're not seeing their entire other life, which uh, was where probably all the problems really are, right? So just by knowing like, hey, I'm going into this with limited information and limited data. And of course, you know, you're being a data analyst, I, I would say, you know, the, with the example of the taking a test and doing bad, it's like, okay, well, how do you how do you make that decision? How do you know when to update or not? Well, part of it is make sure that you're taking that data all the time so you can compare it, right? If you're just saying like, oh, that's, you know, not that's there was just that one time. Uh, that's that's one thing. But if you're not looking at the data and you're seeing like, yeah, I want to tell myself that. But if I look at the trend of my last five tests, they're all going down. Then you can know, right? Like, yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, several things come up and there's so many interesting things like all wrapped into this. The first is that, again, one of our strengths is that we can build these schemas, we can learn off very small sample sizes. And it makes me think about how everything we know about the evolution of man comes from fossils that would fit in the back of a pickup truck. Basically, that's the if you took every human wow. fossil that we'd ever find, any any human humanoid fossil, they would fit in the back of a pickup truck. We have very, very oh, small God. amounts of of evidence Right, but we're able to piece all of that together and, and understand this incredible story of, of where we came from physically, right? Like where humans evolved from. 
And as humans, we do this too, right? She only has to see, she only had to see one dog and one cat to understand what dogs and cats were. Now, that very small sample size meant that there were some gaps in her understanding that she could refine as she got new data. But we do have this incredible ability to craft pretty robust schemas about the world, these, these pretty good patterns about the world from very small amounts of data. But that feeds into your question of when do you maintain your schema as new information comes in? And you know when do you assimilate it? And when do you accommodate it? When do you trust that the new information is you know, enough for you to update it. And there's no single rule about this. Like I have in actual data analysis, I have people ask me that question about, well, is this a big enough sample size? There is no one answer to that question. Right. It's influenced <laughs> by so many things. And it's the same with as we move through the world. And it's funny because there are also all sorts of different ways about how we perceive incoming information that will influence the weight we give it to right. whether we should update you know, how we see the world, you know, there's things that like newer information is always, always weighs heavier in our mind or almost always weighs heavier in our mind than old information. Okay, go grab them. Yeah. Um, and so you have like, hang on. So you have this idea that like recency, right? Something that we've seen recently is going to be more, more impressive to us than something we've seen later. Something that's emotionally charged will be more important, will weigh heavier in our brains as data than something that's neutral. And something that's negatively emotionally charged will also weigh more than something that's positively emotionally charged. And there's all sorts of things like this. And so keeping those in mind too, of like when you're weighing data, we don't even weigh data evenly. So it's not even like there's there's a lot of complexity in in that perception of how how do we know when to update uh, based on that incoming information, because most of the time we don't have a lot of data that's supporting, you know, these ways we see the world. And again, that's good most of the time because it means that we only need a few experiences to figure out how to get through the world. But it. Oh, we lost your sound again. That's weird. <laughs> it's still gone but oh there now it's back okay cool yeah it takes a second to catch up no worries you, uh, um, but yeah i am sense. gonna have to run yeah but... <laughs> well thank you so much uh i appreciate it and uh of course there's there's so much more that we could say um but i'm gonna let you run is real quick um bef and I'll, of course i'm gonna talk some more after you leave but is there a, a recent uh, podcast episode that you would like to to plug for your heart soul and data podcast Oh no, your 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 mic's messed up again. That's weird. Well, I'll just uh, I'll look one up for you and I'll share it with you. Y'all have a great day. Uh, so thank you again to Alexandra um, for for helping us out with that. And um, for those who aren't aware of the podcast that I'm talking about, um, the one she has is called Heart, Soul, and Data. And I just shared a link to her episodes um, so you can see. Um, the last one was on communication data. So how can you use your data to improve your communication and social media? So that's one that I'm sure um, is benefits more of the small businesses and the nonprofits and things like that that she helps. Um, but there's certainly plenty of episodes within there where you can <clears throat> you can get some stuff out of it yourself, even if you don't have a, a business or a nonprofit that you're trying to work in. So one of the things I wanted to, to point out um, to about, hold on one second, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me, can I clear my throat a little? Let me clear my throat. You're welcome for that. So one of the things I wanted to point out was in science, uh, ideally what you're doing is you're isolating variables and you're measuring using very precise tools, right? Now, if you want to see how long something is, you have a ruler and you can look and see how long that thing is. But obviously us as humans, we are not that, we're not that specific. Um, so, you know, as she started to list off some of the things, oh, there's a recency and you overweight negative and this and that and the other. And, and there are so many layers of biases and things like that that affect the way that we think and the things that we believe um, that, you know, unless you want to like really dive into it and find out what all of them are, you know, like psychologists do, uh, you're not going to understand all of it. 
Um, and that's okay. You know, as y'all are sitting here updating your schemas based off of what we've talked about today, um, <clears throat> recognize that it's okay for you to not know all of the biases and all of the reasons and all of the things that are making your view and your thought and your quote unquote data that you're taking of the world is flawed. <clears throat> well, of course it's just kind of stuck in there. Sorry about that. Windpipe. Um, but just recognize that, hey, I'm measuring with the ruler that's not always going to give me the exactly what I'm looking at. It's not always six inches. Sometimes it may be something else. Sometimes it may be bigger, maybe smaller. Maybe it's not even rulers the best thing to use here. Um, but if you just go in knowing that, hey, this is imperfect, um, and let me try and, one, uh, just at least recognize that, but um, two, maybe try and take a couple of steps to Maybe get data for some other people. Maybe make sure you're exposing yourself to different sources of data and things like that to where you can um, make those accommodations and, and update your views of the world on these things. So, uh, <coughs> man, if you guys ha have any tricks to clear in your throat, maybe, I don't know, a pipe cleaner, you know, maybe, maybe help <laughs> or what, but... Um, but yeah, um, I think we'll probably keep keep today a, a little bit shorter. There's there's a lot a lot more that kind of popped into my head, and a lot more that we could could chat about on this one. But we'll keep today nice, short, and sweet and punchy. So let me know what you guys think about assimilation and accommodation. You know, are there some times in your life where maybe you had some big uh, accommodation updates where you're like, "Whoa, oh, I never realized that or thought of it that way." Um, so our, our challenge for today, let's see, let's see. I think, you know, I, I, I believe we had some sort of challenge similar to this, uh, a way back. Um, but you know what? That's okay. Um, it's slightly different. So I want you to think about something in your worldview, uh, something that you think uh, about uh, the way the world works. Maybe it's a way you think about a single person. You know, maybe there's a certain person in your life or your relationship with that person, or maybe it's with a company or some sort of organization or system, or maybe it's some big institution like the police or government or whatever it may be. Um, or maybe it's a group of people. Right? Maybe it, you know, like we were talking about race, or maybe there's some, some other stereotypes, and maybe it's blondes, you know, whatever it may be. I want you to think about one of these stereotypes, or one of these relationships, or one of these worldviews that you have about this people, group of people, or organization. And I want you to examine it, and I want you to think about, like, okay, first off, where am I getting my information about this person or group? And how is that affecting what my view would be? You know, even before I start, you know, seeing things through my lens, where I'm getting that information from may be skewed and, and let me rephrase, is skewed and biased and, and is coming with its own set of problems before you even put your filter on it, right? Um, so recognizing where you, you got your information about this thing and, and, Try and figure out what are some of the, the, the shortcomings of that, that way of acquiring that information. Then uh, I want you to try and see, okay, well, how could I try and learn more about this person or this organization um, or these people? Um, how could I expose myself to some other information, some other data, some other learning around them um, that I could accommodate and update my worldview on this person or organization? Um, so yeah, so that, that's your challenge for today. But other than that, you know, I got one reason to keep it short. It's my anniversary and it's hump day. So with that, I'm out.